And a pleasant good evening and welcome to another edition of Beyond History, where we take a look at faith-based matters, evolution, creation, dinosaurs, and more. Always entertaining. And this time around, you'll have a chance to be entertained and hopefully educated about origin, beliefs, matter. With educator Sid Galloway, a counselor as well. You won't want to miss it. Stay tuned as Beyond History continues. Welcome back to Beyond History. Ken Trahan joined by Sid Galloway, educator, counselor, many things in his professional life. And Sid, it's so glad to have you with us. Great to be here, Ken. Let's talk first of all about education because it's something you've been involved with for quite some time, teaching at North Lake Christian High School in Covington. I love it. I love teaching. Been there about, uh, about 11 years now and uh, great job. I love it. School is wonderful. Uh, but done a lot of things in my past background that kind of led up to this. Uh, 30 years ago, I was a zookeeper at the Audubon Zoo, uh, taking care of elephants and carnivores. Uh, eventually became a Christian, and my heart began to change. Wanted to work with people. Back to school for counseling, and spent 25 years as a family counselor, uh, and then 10 years, 11 years almost now, teaching uh, biology, and I always teased it's almost the same role. <laughs> Talk a little bit about the counseling aspect of what you've done and how rewarding it was and perhaps how difficult it was. Very rewarding. I mean, it's wonderful to watch God work in people's lives, individuals, families. Uh, the difficulty is, though, that over the years, um, all those, those decades, I watched that as the world around us, the secular world became more and more anti-biblical, anti-Christian, and secular humanistic psychology began to increase, including the whole concept of, of evolutionary psychology, is that uh, people begin to lose faith in the scripture for both its origins as well as its practical counsel for how to live life. From an education perspective, teaching at a Christian-based school where you can freely express your own right. beliefs and to teach what you believe, in your case, through science and biology, that has to be rewarding, I would imagine. It's wonderful. I'm spoiled. To be mm -hmm. able to talk about God, to talk about Scripture, and to integrate uh, the Word of God as we study God's world, is you know, there's just no better place to do that. It's wonderful. A couple of websites, too. I know soulcare.org in yeah. particular. Yeah, my website that I've kind of really is just kind of a repository of uh, my scatterbrain notes over the years and for my students is soulcare.org. Lots of websites out there that are wonderful in, in these areas. There's uh, Creation Ministries International, Answers in Genesis, Institute of Creation Research. A lot of good places where there are a lot of experts with good information. All right, we're going to talk a little bit about evolution versus creationism, obviously. And origins, belief, matter. That's the the bullet point, the topic point here today. And let's talk a little bit about that and exactly what that references. Ed. Sure. Yeah, you know, the, most people, not most people, a lot of, of individuals, Christians even, and even pastors today, get an idea that let's just focus on the gospel, that this whole idea of origins, creation versus evolution doesn't really matter. In fact, maybe it's just unnecessarily divisive. What a lot have never thought through. And uh, to be honest, I didn't originally, you know, when I, I was an atheist uh, growing up, uh, eventually when I became a Christian and, and an evolutionist and eventually I became a creationist, I still thought, you know, well, maybe it's not that important. But then I had actually some Ph.D. scientists that began to help me understand who were Christians, who began to help me understand that what someone believes about origins, about creation versus evolution, is foundational to every other doctrine in Christianity uh, from the very beginning. And, and when, for everything from the character of God, whether or not Scripture is trustworthy, whether the gospel is true, and how we're supposed to glorify God and how we're supposed to live out our life. All of it is founded and based right there in Genesis. Explain, let's digress a little bit about the fact that your origins were of an atheist nature. I'm a cradle Christian, so I don't really understand right. yeah. that. Talk about what began to change your heart, that process, how you arrived yeah. at where you are today. Well, I appreciate the opportunity to share that because there's so many people out there who are struggling with some of the things, things same things that I did. You know, originally I, I grew up in, in uh, a home where you know, my wonderful parents, uh, church all the time, not a lot of answers for the big questions in life. You know, where did you come from? Why, why are we here? Where are we going? Uh, especially those origins. And I always had the idea uh, from science that I always loved, you know, the concept of Adam and Eve, a literal Adam and Eve, and the earth being a uh, young earth, as the scripture indicates, uh, was just incompatible with science. So I had rejected all of that. I wasn't a Christian as a result, rejected scripture, went off into the New Age movement and trying to find answers and things. And eventually, as the evidence continued to, you know, studying science uh, was one of the main areas that began to open my eyes as I saw that 
the beauty and complexity of the universe, especially life with DNA and, and uh, the molecular machinery, uh, impossible, both scientifically and statistically, for that to have just happened by natural chemical processes. Therefore, some supernatural source had to have put that together, especially the coded information in, in DNA. So I began to realize, all right, there's got to be a creator. Then I began to search the world religions and try and look at, find out who might this world, uh, this, this uh, leader, uh, creator be. And eventually the evidence again, the historical evidence led me to the scripture and to who Christ is and realized that uh, Christ is who he claimed to be and accepted Christ. And as a result, your life has changed clearly and yeah. dramatically. And I sense that you now feel you have a purpose as a result. Oh yeah, I think all of us as Christians have a purpose as, um, you know, we're not here just to, uh, to get saved and go to heaven. We're here to uh, be a part of God's plan to reach it, to glorify Him in everything we do, but then also to reach as many people as possible who might have ears to hear. People are hearing and they're seeing right now, so here's an opportunity before we move on and talk about creation and evolution to share. As I say in the secular world all the time, if I'm wrong, I've lost nothing. If I'm right, I've gained everything. That's exactly right, yeah. And the, the wonderful thing is that God has allowed, especially in the new discoveries of the last 10, 20, 30 years, massive amounts of evidence in every field of, of science and history to verify and back up the Bible from the very beginning. And, and when I say the Bible, you know, there's so many different Christian perspectives. Today there is. It, there wasn't over the 2,000 years of, of, uh, of Christianity different perspectives on what God meant in Genesis, but you probably heard the phrase, you know, that God said what he meant and meant what he said. Mm -hmm. He did. God loves us, and he wrote, he gave, led Moses to write in Genesis something clear, plain, and simple so that even a youth can understand it. Nobody has to twist it around, and anybody who reads it recognizes it clearly is communicating that God created in six days, rested on the seventh, and if you add up all those boring genealogies in the Old Testament, you discover that it was about 6,000 years ago, so a young earth. But there are evidences in every field, in astrophysics, geophysics, biology, that back that up and, and demonstrate that that is an accurate account of history, his story. The problem is that so few people hear about that, so they reject that, they embrace the world's view, and once you begin to do that, especially if you adopt the evolutionary view of survival of the fittest, parasites, predators, and then you begin to think, well, there's, there must be a God. Well, then you're thinking God must have designed it that way. But that destroys the character of God. That's the most important issue here. It isn't creation versus evolution. It's Christ, the good shepherd, versus survival of the fittest and the pain, fear, horror, and death that God didn't create. It was brought in by the infection of sin. His story and history. Yeah. You spell them the same. That's exactly the synchronization right. is amazing, isn't it? Yeah. And how you view history. If we look at history, as a, a God created everything, deliberately designing this process of, of predators and parasites, then that God becomes a monster. And deep down, people begin to wonder. They either, they either reject completely the idea of God or it undermines their trust in who he is. But the good news, the full gospel good news, is that from the very beginning, God says he didn't do that. He says that not only did he create a paradise, a Garden of Eden, where the people lived in, in peace and harmony, Adam and Eve, the animals even, were vegetarian, it says very clearly in Genesis chapter 1 at the end. Then it even promises that in the uh, new heaven and new earth, when Christ restructures and recreates a new creation, that it will be restored back to what it was in the beginning. That's the picture where it says that in Isaiah 11 and 65, it says that, that the uh, leopard and the lion will eat grass like the ox and the wolf will lay down with the lamb back restored to what it was in the beginning. That's the character of our, our creator. That's why origins matters. People uh, thinking that it's not that big of a deal. If someone believes that evolution is true, macroevolution, the idea of, of microbes to monkeys to man over a process of survival of the fittest, then, and if God did that, then that undermines the very character of God and the, uh, uh, the authority of Scripture and the trustworthiness of Scripture because if people begin to read it plain and simple, it doesn't say that in the Bible. So if people are saying, well, evolution is true, and the Bible clearly doesn't really teach that, therefore the Bible has an error at the very beginning, then automatically it puts doubt from the beginning all the way through. And that's what I see happening with the youth today. The number, when I travel and speak, I spoke at LSU not long back, and a uh, big crowd of folks at LSU, and one of the biggest reasons that the students were saying that they rejected Scripture, all of it, was because they believed and had been convinced by the professors that Genesis was wrong. Mm. If the start's wrong, it's not going to end well. That's exactly right. Starts right, it's going to end well. That's yeah. what we believe, obviously. Yeah. 
and what we believe is what we're going to get into when we return in just a moment. We'll talk about creation evolution and about why it's so important when you talk about this within the context of science and morality. All that's still to come. Glad you joined us. It's Beyond History. Ken Trahan with Sid Galloway back in just a moment. Beyond History continues, Ken Trahan with Sid Galloway, and now we delve into creation versus evolution. Sid, as we talk about this much discussed topic, much debated, sometimes maligned, and sometimes heatly debated, right. uh, what is it uh, about creation versus evolution that makes it such an important subject when it comes to science and morality? You know, as I mentioned earlier, you know, there's four major areas, at least from my perspective, and I always try and share with my students, there's four areas where the issue of, of origins, what you believe about creation versus evolution, has a major impact. The character of God, the trustworthiness of Scripture, and then the gospel itself, and then the fourth thing is how we're to live our life, how to glorify God. You know, I ask students, when I travel and speak, you know, I ask adults, they're Christians, you know, what is your purpose in life? What's to glorify God? Well, what does that mean? It means living and reflecting who He is. And as I said earlier, if, if God is a God who created everything through evolution, the violent process of pain, fear, suffering, and death, survival of the fittest, then logical extension of that would be the way to imitate Him and to reflect His character would to live like that. And that's actually what Adolf Hitler did, not just Adolf Hitler, but every atheistic society that uh, has has developed a culture-wide evolutionary atheistic viewpoint. Hitler, Stalin, Lenin, Mao in China, every single one of them manifested the fruit of living it out that ended up in not just the German Holocaust but horrible uh, examples of, of cultural degeneration and, and abuse of people as a result of survival of the fittest, the idea Hitler did what he did. And, you know, a lot of times you'll hear evolutionists who will say, oh, Christians and creationists uh, make that stuff up. But that's not, Hitler didn't follow evolution. Uh, Dr. Weichart at uh, University of California uh, has written a book called Hitler's Ethic, uh, very carefully tracing the, the history of the development of Hitler's thinking, Germany's thinking, and how it grew as the fruit that grew out of the root of believing that. So. It's not only important for the individual, it's important for the culture itself. You know, very, very important. And then, of course, the gospel. You know, I, I've mentioned to somebody recently that when I first became a Christian, you know, I didn't really realize how important and how connected. I, I knew, understood what Christ had done for me. I understood that, that Christ died for my sins. But I didn't understand the connection between Genesis, the first Adam, and Jesus, who's called the second Adam. Jesus died for our sins, the gospel because man sinned, not just all men, but the first man, Adam, which is why in Romans 5 it says that. So if there was no real Adam who brought in death and suffering as a result of his sin, as the first time death and suffering came into creation, if that isn't true, then Christ died for nothing and the gospel is useless. The Bible says that death and suffering is not a part of God's design. It is an infection that came in through sin and separation which then brought in the escalating disorder, dysfunction, disease, and death that Christ came to fix and that God promises in the new heaven and new earth uh, that he's going to remove so that we have another paradise forever. I look forward to that. You know, as a former zookeeper, I've kind of already put in my prayer request of job application to be a zookeeper again. I like it. Jesus said it is finished. And yep. then he committed himself into his father's arms and hands. And then he rose from the dead, defeated death to defeat our sin. Right. That is what we believe. It's the basis of what we believe. And yet when you talk to people, you have to start somewhere. You have to have a basis or a starting point to be able to get to where you eventually want to lead them. So as a result, yeah. you know, talk about the basics and of examining, right. you know, the, the whole concept of science and Christianity. Yeah. Creation evangelism is a phrase that I've, I've heard a lot of other people use, and now I like it. I think, you know, instead of being afraid of talking about this issue, well, we've got the Noah movie that just came out that, that seems to deliberately be designed to ridicule scripture and the, and the biblical idea and the character of God, the Cosmos series on Sunday nights where you have uh, a, a, a deliberate attempt to, under, we're using science to undermine the concept not just of God and religion but particularly the Bible. Instead of shying away from that and being afraid of it, 
we hopefully will be able to communicate and spread the word that these organizations that I mentioned earlier, Answers in Genesis, Creation Ministries International, Institute in Creation Research, teams of scholars in science and scripture that have materials available to use to help people, as you said, get them to the cross. And I love to start with uh, the whole issue, not just start with creation, because uh, you know sometimes that kind of sidelines with that issue, but start with what everybody's thinking about as a former counselor too, suffering. People come to counseling because either they or their family or someone in their family, some suffering is going on. Um, everybody's thinking about that. Well, why is it there? Where did it come from? And how do we deal with that? That's the hard issue that everybody's dealing with, and we can start with that right at Genesis and walk it forward towards the cross and recognize that the Creator who didn't want suffering to be there, didn't design it, made a solution for the suffering that's there, not only in the world itself, but personally in individual lives. And I found it to be really effective with people being able to, of course, it immediately starts their mind thinking of, wait a minute, if you're saying that Genesis is true, show us those evidences. And, you know, as time unfolds, uh, those kind of evidences are, are more and more available in every area. Why is the subject of creation versus evolution so important to the concept of science and morality in particular? Morality is, you know, the world doesn't like to talk about morality, ethics. Uh, we, we live in a world where relative ethics and relative morality The is line gets everywhere. moved all the time. It's right. blurred. Yeah, and it gets fuzzier and fuzzier and fuzzier. Mm -hmm. Everybody has a morality. The problem is that those who aren't coming from a biblical perspective, starting with the recognition that there is a God, like Romans 1.20 says, that the creation reveals and makes it obvious there's a creator and a God, no excuse. But then from a biblical standpoint of a standard of morality, our country was, was, was begun on the idea and the concepts of biblical morality. When you don't have that, morality does become relative and, and you no longer have an absolute standard and it becomes pretty much uh, everybody's opinion, whatever the majority may vote for, and then you end up with every culture that has collapsed, the Greek, the Roman, uh, over history, has generally collapsed from within due to the folly morality. And as I mentioned earlier, the ones that, that had the worst fruit growing out of that immorality are those that had a, an evolutionary philosophy at their very core. And unfortunately, it seems that that's where the world is heading now. Uh, but the good news is we have this now mount, massive mountain of evidence uh, being uh, discovered and disseminated now through these groups of scholars that make it available for us to use books, DVDs. Nobody has, the Christian doesn't have to become an expert in these areas. That's already been done by the experts that are out there. I've traveled at conferences out there that uh, you don't hear about these scientists. I sat next to the inventor of the MRI, Dr. Demadian, who's a biblical creationist. Mm -hmm. uh, Dr. John Sanford at Cornell University, a retired professor there in genetics who invented the biolistic gene gun. Uh, these guys are out there who have done the research, written the materials, and, and have those available for us to use and to uh, help people recognize that, that origins matters and that there's an answer and a package of evidence that demonstrates the Bible is absolutely trustworthy. Uh, no question, and that's clearly what it all leads to. I mean, yeah. obviously, you, there's an alpha, there's an omega, there's a beginning, there's an end, but with God, there is no end, and His kingdom right. will have no end. And that's, that's exactly what we right. adhere to and what we trust in and what we believe in. And, and what we must share with others when yeah. given the opportunity to Great Commission. Right. You know, a lot of times, you know, you mentioned uh, a couple of times, you know, the connection there with science itself. So many people misunderstand science. If you watch a commercial on TV and you have a person trying to convince you of a drug or some hair product and they've got a lab coat and a stethoscope, everybody just assumes that's a doctor, even though it may be an actor, right? But because they think it's a, a scientist or a doctor, they immediately give that person the authority because of that, that whatever they're saying is true and it's always the same as any kind of science. And it's not. One of the things I try to help my students understand, and I think anybody can really see this, not all sciences are of equal certainty. We used to call it co uh, hard sciences and soft sciences. I like to call it direct and indirect sciences. When you're looking at history, for example, if, if uh, if I had a, a package of a bag full of dead bones here that somebody had found, uh, we could examine that, see, right, in direct science, because all the variables are in the present. It, we can do an experiment, find out that they're bones and what kind of an animal it is, maybe by DNA testing. But when you start asking questions like, when did that animal die? How did that animal die? Where did that animal die? No longer is it the same direct science. It becomes a soft science, more like forensics, 
That's what paleontology and archaeology really are. But instead of thinking that, most people think that what is claimed about everything from the age of the earth, um, the uh, time the dinosaurs lived, that all of that is the same kind of absolute certain science as any other science, and it's really not. When we return to close things out, we'll talk about spreading the truth. Stay tuned as Beyond History continues. Beyond History continues. Ken Trahan with Sid Galloway. And Sid, as we close things out on this particular show, talk about how we can spread the truth of Christ the Creator. Appreciate that. As I mentioned earlier, creation evangelism to me is, is one of the most fun ways to, to share the gospel. And first, just to repeat the organizations that are there, because you know a lot of times my students even call me a, a, a scientist or an expert, but I'm not. I'm not a scientist. I'm not an expert. Don't need to be. There are experts out there, and those organizations that I most respect, Answers in Genesis, Creation Ministries International, and Institute of Creation Research are teams of scholars that have plenty of materials for us. And then from there, gathering, reading, learning, whatever somebody might want to learn, but always knowing you can just pass that stuff out to others. Um, the best way to start, is from my perspective, and maybe this is just personal to me because it's such a big deal, but as I said, as a counselor, everybody's dealing with suffering. And if you think about it, statistically in surveys, everybody believes in God. Everybody wants to know if the God exists, why is there suffering? And there's no better way to carry someone and lead them from that concern to the cross of Christ than that issue that's most important to their heart, suffering, whether it's their own individual life, whether it's their family. I think that's very well stated as everything has been here. This evening, Sid, it's a pleasure. Thank you for joining appreciate us. Appreciate it. We appreciate it. And My Sid privilege. will rejoin us next week. We'll talk about DNA. You won't want to miss that, so make sure you're here with us for our next show. Until then, for Sid Galloway, I'm Ken Trey, and for Beyond History saying thanks for joining us and be a good sport. God bless you one and all. We are rounding third and heading home. So long.